three. Additionally, nearly all movement of wastes and materials to or from Hanford traveled through Oregon, either by road, by rail, or by barge. And you'll hear more about that from Ken Miles in part five of our series as he closes it out for us. So who am I? I'm Dirk Dunning. I'm a registered professional chemical engineer and a formally licensed nuclear power engineer. I am an expert in many fields of engineering and science, and I worked in the nuclear, chemical, and semiconductor industries for 16 years before coming to work for the state of Oregon. And I've worked on hampered issues almost exclusively for the past 20 years. Things are seldom easy at Hanford. The workers that you see here were working on installing a mixing pump into one of the big double shell tanks, SY-101. Work at Hanford often requires extensive protection from exposure and work to prevent the spread of radioactive waste. So who are we? We are the Oregon Department of Energy and in particular, the Nuclear Safety and Energy Emergency Preparedness Division. Uh, we also work on, we, we work on cleanup of the Hanford site in Washington State, and we also work on energy issues for the state, developing energy policies, siting and permitting new energy facilities, residential and commercial energy loans, and we respond to energy and other nuclear emergencies. So what do we do? You heard of the overview of our involvement last week from Ken Miles. This week I will focus on the tank waste problem and what the Federal Department of Energy is doing and how that might impact all of us in the future. On a daily basis we read a lot. We attend meetings with scientists, engineers, technical staff, managers, the public, contractors, politicians, and others. We argue the merits of various technical issues to ensure the best outcome we can achieve for the future and for protection of the Columbia River of Oregonians. We make presentations of all sorts, and we read and we study more. So where is Hanford again? The Hanford site is located in the arid desert of South Central Washington State. We'll come back to this more a little later. On the site, there is one site, but two federal offices. The U.S. Department of Energy has two major offices at Hanford. The Office of River Protection, so named by the Congress, handles the tanks, their waste, and the treatment of the lakes. The Richland Field Office handles all of the other issues on site. There's also a smaller Office of Science branch at Hanford that operates the Pacific Northwest National Lab. So what did Hanford do? Hanford's mission was to produce plutonium for nuclear bombs, simply. They operated nine large production reactors to do that. They operated five immense canyon facilities. These are structures that are 1,200 feet long and seven stories high with a hollow center. They produced 111 metric tons of plutonium, most of it for bombs, and they produced one metric ton of uranium-233, also mostly for bombs. Hanford also served as a test bed for breeder reactor development, production of special isotopes for the military, industrial, and for medicinal use. The tanks. To set the stage, the tanks at Hanford are huge. The largest are 75 to 80 feet across and 50 feet high, buried 7 to 8 feet underground. The tank wastes are also enormous. There's approximately 176 million curies of radioactivity in the tanks, about 240,000 tons of chemical waste. Um, there's 149 tanks with a single steel wall, so-called single shell tanks, which range in size from 50,000 to 1 million gallons. There are 67 of those that in the past are known or suspected to have leaked to the ground and leaked a total of about 1 million gallons and 1 million curies of radioactivity to the soil. There's 28 double shell tanks at Hanford. These are tanks that are a tank within a tank. They range in capacity from a million gallons to a little over a million at 1.15 million gallons. We now know in the past week that one of these is also a leaker, though not to the environment. There's also an immense amount of waste measured in other ways. The tanks contain something in the neighborhood of 53 to 56 million gallons of highly radioactive waste. Half a ton of plutonium is in the tanks, and much more is in the adjacent soil sites and sites of the 200 area. 
Dozens of radioactive and chemical contaminants are in the tanks, including cesium-137, strontium-90, technetium-99, plutonium, uranium, neptunium-237, tritium, carbon-14, and a host of others. There's also a very large waste treatment plant complex under construction. Its estimated current cost is $12.2 billion for the entire facility to classify the waste for disposal. And that's only for the first part of the plant. There's an additional approximately 40% of the waste that needs an additional plant. This complex is made up of, of five areas, four large ones and a small. There's the pretreatment plant that separates and prepares the waste a high-activity glass plant that processes 10% of the waste by volume, containing about 90% of the radioactivity. There's a low-activity waste glass plant and a yet-to-be-designed plant to treat the 90% of the waste that remains, containing 10% of the radioactivity. And then there's also the analytical laboratory and the fifth area, the balance of facilities, all the other necessary things. The central plateau at Hanford, which you see here in an image from satellite, it's so named because it's a raised area in the center of the site. It is a large river bar left over from the cataclysmic floods that washed through the Hanford site 13 to 15,000 years ago in a series of 60 or more giant floods. The rocks and soil left behind by these floods and the channels they carve through the soils and the salts hugely complicate the movement of water and waste beneath the site. The, uh, In the center of the site, these areas have been designated by a numbering and naming system as 200 west and 200 east, which you can see on the chart. To the right, you also see an area that is the waste treatment plant complex. The 200 west and 200 east areas each cover about a dozen square miles and are home to the processing canyons and plants, the tank farms, and most of Amford's burial grounds. Just east of 200 east is the waste treatment plant complex to deal with the waste. Within these areas are the 18 waste management area, or 18 tank farms grouped into five waste management areas. All five waste management areas have leaking tanks that have already impacted groundwater. Twelve of the tank farms contain only single shell tanks, 149 in all. Six of the tank farms contain double shell tanks, and those are the ones highlighted in yellow. The tank farms are designated by the number 241, followed by one or two letters and the number of the tank. Large tanks num are numbered beginning with the number 100, and smaller 55,000 gallon tanks are numbered beginning with 200. So you'll see numbers such as 241C106 is a particular tank. So this is what the single shell tanks looked like under construction. There were in total six types of single shell tanks, ranging from the little 55,000 gallon type ones all the way up to the million gallon type three are type four A, B, and Cs. The first five tank farms built from 1943 to 47 contained 530,000 gallon tanks and the little 55,000 gallon tanks. The next four tank farms built from 1948 to 1952 contained three quarter million gallon tanks. And then the last three single shell tank farms were built from 1953 to 1965 at one million gallons each. And so that the newest of the old single shell tanks is already over half a century old. This is another drawing of what those single shell tanks look like. And the one reason I wanted to include this is if you look at the tank in the bottom right, you see some hanging pipes in it. These are called airlift circulators. What they did was to pump air down into the bottom of these and allow it to rise up through the tube and use that as a way to mix the waste. This is tank farm 241A. In the picture, you can see in the back the Purex processing canyon up to the upper middle left. Far in the background, you can see Rattlesnake Mountain stretching across the site. And in the near foreground, you see the, the hole that's been dug to construct the 241A tank farm. This tank farm was principally for processing the waste coming out of this canyon, the Purex canyon. Also in the upper right corner of the photo, you may see a small plant with two exhaust stacks. This was one of the two steam plants built on site that powered most of Hanford's operations. The next series of slides I'll go through show you what the single shell tanks looked like under construction. So we start here with the base map that was laid down 
then concrete that was placed on top of that and, and into the rebar. And then they began constructing the stainless or the uh, steel tanks. These are not stainless steel, they're carbon steel tanks. And so here what you see is the tanks partially built without the concrete around them. A little later on with more concrete. And if you notice in some of the tanks, there's water. What they did is as the tanks were nearing completion, they filled them with water to test them for leaks. And then they would complete the concrete up the sides once they were fairly certain the tanks were well built and begin filling or backfilling the area with sand and compacting it. This is later yet when the uh, domes are beginning to be put onto the tanks. And if you'll notice, you see the open tanks for three of them. And for the other three, you see concrete domes going on top. The tanks themselves were actually built like kettles with no steel top, and the top of the tank is concrete. This gives you some idea of how they went about putting up shoring for the steel rebar and concrete pours to build the top of the tank. And again, the same. Then they put in the steel rebar going up over the top and finally poured the concrete and then began producing the trenches to contain a lot of the piping interconnecting all of these, these tanks with the processing facility. And this is what a tank farm looks like once it's done. This happens to be the 241AP tank farm, which is just nearby. Inside the tanks, one of the things that you can see is the construction where you can see on the top of this picture the concrete dome of the tank. At the bottom is steel, which is somewhat corroded, which is the reason it looks somewhat orange. And in between, you see the lead flashing that helps to deflect water back into the tank if there's any waste or water sprayed above the top of the steel. So the single farm tank, tank farm construction, they were designed to with a 20-year design life. Many of them are three times that old today and more. Each of them was built to have a single carbon steel wall that ranged from three quarters of an inch thick at the bottom to three eighths of an inch at the top. The tanks are made of plates of sheet steel that are welded together across the bottom and then five bands or courses with decreasing thickness from the bottom of the tank to the top. Many of the tanks were operated as cascades. Waste went into the first tank, then overflowed through a buried pipe into the second tank. That then overflowed into a third tank. And the way these were designed, there was a sliding sleeve connection between the tanks that was filled with packing. And if that leaked, as you can see in the diagram, you could have a leak directly to the soil that isn't technically a leaking tank by most people's thinking, but under the regulations is. Or in some cases, they had connections that were not used where they filled the tanks above the pipe levels and simply overflowed into the soil. All total, in operating the tank farms, they discharged something in the neighborhood of 300 million gallons of waste directly into the soil via cribs and trenches, which is a more detailed area of discussion we can type in on another time. Beneath the tanks, when they began to identify that they had leaks, particularly under some of the really thermally hot tanks, physically hot, they went in and installed caissons that are six foot diameter shafts going down beside the tank and then pipes underneath were drilled that are the under tank laterals. And they look something like what you see here. From each one of the caissons there were typically three or four laterals drilled trying to reach underneath the tanks to see if they could find where there may be leaks. They also, as you can see with the dark circles, sank wells down 60 feet or so that were called dry wells. And they were so called because they never reached groundwater. And those were used, by the way, to send radiation probes down to, to find out whether or not they could see radioactivity at different levels. When you look at the overview of a tank farm, this is the T and TY and TX tank farms, you can get some idea of some of the plumes underneath them but if you'll notice on the right, there is a separate kind of way of looking at these where they've gone in and used ground penetrating radar and other techniques to try to find both waste and infrastructure. And in this case, the orange lines that you see are the piping that showed up 
from the radar. This is the SNSX tank farm, and it shows you a somewhat different look where you can see the location of wells that were drilled around the farm to try to locate uh, contamination as they drill down, but also particularly to measure what was in the groundwater and to try to identify where leaks were coming from. This is an example of what the tanks looked like when they had waste in them. It's a mixture of floating crust of salts on top of a dark liquid. Inside, the radiation levels are extremely high and destroy cameras very rapidly. This is a bit later in another tank where the waste has been pumped down and concentrated. What you see is the remaining salts and sludges and hard heels where all the pumpable liquid has been removed, leaving behind only the solids and the liquids entrained in the solids. This is another tank yet where you can see different layers of different salts. Most of what was in the tank was a concentrated mix of sodium nitrate and sodium hydroxide, very much like a cough that you use at home. You can also see the black band at the top. When they built the tanks, they put con they, they built the steel and then they put a layer of asphaltic material before they poured the concrete. And that tar-like material shows up in many cases inside the tanks when you look now. In this case, you can see the yellow color. That actually is the color of the waste and it has to do with the chemistry. In some of the tanks, we can also see where the concrete has had surface cracking and in some cases spalling, where chips of the concrete have come off of the tank itself. In other tanks, like this one, you can see the steel ribs going around the side in one of the designs, but you can also see where the, the marks are that there's been liquid coming into the tank and running down the wall of the inside of the tank. In addition to the problem of having tanks leak, out to the environment, some of the tanks are showing evidence of water or, or something leaking into the tank. In the past decade, the Department of Energy has been working quite diligently to try to empty these very old single shelf tanks that are out of compliance. And in doing that, they've started their focus with the sea tank farm. They've just recently finished pumping out the tenth of the tanks in the sea farm. And in the next two years, they hope to finish the uh, other tanks in that farm. And at that point, the sea farm will be the first tank to enter a process called tank farm closure. Under the Tri-Party Agreement and Consent Order, there's a series of dates set and, and uh, other work in order to accomplish to close tank farms. Once all of the tanks in a tank farm are empty, the Tri-Party Agreement lays out the process for how to decide what additional work, if any, is needed and how to close the farm either by removing it or by burying it underneath an engineered barrier. So that's the single shell tanks. So we'll move on to the double shell tank. These, these were built somewhat later. This is one of the tank farms laid in construction. And I'm now going to focus on the very first tank farm, double shell tank farm that was built, which is the 241AY farm. And I focus on it because the most recent information that we had is about the leaking of 241Y AY-102. And the AY-102 tank is one of the two in this farm. This is early in the process where they're laying down steel to form the first concrete base mat underneath the tanks. They then went in and laid down the concrete mat and drainage structure and built the first bottom of the tank. This is the bottom of the outer tank. Once they finished welding, they then went in and began work on the, uh, the second tank. And they also then had to lift the first, the uh, second tank out of the ground, as you can see with the shoring underneath, so that they could get access to the wells. When they built the AY tank farm, they indicate that 36% of the wells were suspect and needed to be redone. And that meant workers crawling underneath and actually welding on the tank. They then went in, in the inside tank of, the, of the, uh, the outer tank, and laid a drainage barrier, which is a material called kaolite. It's an insulating material that has drainage channels in it 
so that if there were a leak from the primary tank, it would leak out into the annulus where it could be seen. This is looking down into the tank in the annulus when the inner tank is only partly built and the outer tank is quite a ways up. And again, having to go in once they have put the kaolite in, do the welding on the bottom of the tank, and then go in and repair the kaolite around the edges. They then began work on the steel rebar on the outside of the tank to build a concrete shell. And as they did that, they worked their way up the tank and began filling the entire area as well as putting in a lot of the other structures needed to support the tank. As they get towards the top, you can see you have this deep tank which is difficult to get into and work on, and yet the outside is filled with dirt near to the top. At that point, they began building the wood scaffolding again to get inside the tank and build the, uh, the top on it. They finish doing the steel rebar on the outside as well as putting piping that interconnects the tanks and also the annulus ventilation and, and other piping that goes down into the area between the inner and outer walls. And then inside the tank, they put the airless circulators that I described earlier. Also in the outside of the tank in the annulus, they put in devices that used uh, pretty simple techniques to find leaks into the annulus. Essentially, if liquid flowed into the annulus and rose up to the point it touched these um, leak detectors, they would have a dead short and they knew that they would have liquid there. At the top of the tank, there's something interesting as well. The inner tank is a complete steel tank, unlike the single shell tanks. The outer tank, though, is not. It comes up over the top and then stops before it gets to the middle and they place a flashing ring over the top and tack weld it to the inner tank. They did this because of thermal expansion and contraction of the steel to avoid damaging the tanks. This later caused a problem because it allows in leakage of water between the two tank walls into the annular space. This is one of the very rare pictures of that construction on site. And you can see in the back tank the gap between the primary tank and the partially completed secondary outer tank. And here's a close-up of that same construction. Then they finished the outer uh, steel of the secondary tank, and then went on to actually wrap the entire tank in wool. And the reason they did this was so that they could then use propane to heat these tanks up to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit for four hours to anneal the steel and get the right crystalline structure in the metal. And then they began putting the steel rebar up over the top, and ultimately the concrete on top of that and in that to finish the tank. And then finally what they did was to place all of the piping connections in place that go up to the ground surface when the tank is fully buried. And put the rest of the piping in place around the facility that joins the tank with the processing facilities as well as diversion boxes, connecting boxes, and other things. And here it is nearly done. You can see there's still some fill to do, but you have uh, clean-out covers above some of the ramways and, and other facilities on the tank. 241AY102 is the first leaking double-shell tank. Uh, its construction was from 1968 to 1970. And it contained initially water from the 242A evaporator, or for the 242A evaporator is feed. In 1977, it received its first waste from the B plant. From 1978 to 1980, it received hot waste from the A farm and from BX-104 and elsewhere. And that continued on until 1988 when it received the 97% of high heat sludge waste from the C-106 tank as it was being cleaned out. And from 1998 to 2003, it became a condensate receiver tank and, and other minor things thereafter. Photos between the inner and outer tank walls began to show some unexplained material in mid-August of this year. Additional photos later in August showed more unexpected material in the annuals. And some of this was very similar in appearance to the tank sludge itself. The picture up above the brown material is actual sludge from this tank. 
On October 22nd of this year, earlier this week, DOE declared AY 102 to be a leaking tank. And again, this is a leak that's from the primary tank into its secondary containment, but not out into the environment. This is an isometric view looking at the tank to show you where the risers are. These are the various entries into the tank. And this is a different schematic showing the same thing. The four risers highlighted in red are the ones that have been used to look for uh, leaks of waste that have found things. It, at least two of them have. And so riser 90 at the very top and riser 83 to the lower left in particular have been places where they found material. On August 10th, they took pictures through riser 90 and they found this large mound of brown material near a ventilation riser pipe. They also found as you can see in the other three pictures, white material coming out of the ventilation duct uh, connection or ventilation slot connections underneath the tank. On August 29th, right in riser 83, they found more material of a slightly different color about halfway around the tank. They then started looking for the sources of intrusion, trying to understand where this was coming from. And as a part of that, they looked at the annulus pump pits and other facilities to try to see if this was tank waste or if it might be that they had a leak coming in from the outside or a leak in piping somewhere. DOE is continuing investigations and the Washington State Department of Ecology, which regulates Hanford's tank operations and is, is following the situation closely and has the following to say. Um, they're recommending engineering reviews looking at intrusion to investigate possible sources for entry into the tank, the evaluation of the integrity of the secondary tank, of the primary, the inner tank, and a review of the drawings, tank operations, history, integrity, chemistry, heat loads, and more. Uh, for actions, they're looking for DOE to sample the dried material, which they have, and to try to find the leak sort or source of intrusion, and to follow the emergency pumping guide requirements. Uh, also to pump out the leak pump pit or leak pit pump and ensure nothing is getting out of the secondary tank. The ecology has said that they expect that the annulus will be clean and the tank recertified as fit for use by an independent registered engineer for the dangerous waste requirements or be removed from service. So what are the future implications of this? Well they're rather large actually because AY-102 was the designated feed tank for the waste treatment plant to process all of the tank waste. There's an increased need for monitoring and sampling, not just of this tank, but of all tanks. And there's a loss of, if there's a loss of DST tank space, it should require the emergency pumping and repair of the tank. But it also then impacts severely the retrieval of other tanks. There's never been one of these DST that has been fully pumped out to date. And there are serious questions about how one goes about actually repairing such a tank. The emergency pumping guide that I alluded to before is a procedure that was set up late or about 15 years ago that includes a set of strategies for different conditions. One of these is for the strategy for emergency pumping after a minor leak. And it describes something that looks very much like what we're seeing today. And the objective from this strategy was to pump out the waste from the primary tank and the annulus within 24 hours or as timely as possible. As it turns out, because of technical limitations and other problems, Ecology, Washington State Department of Ecology and the DOE have relaxed this requirement to allow 90 days to pump the waste. So under the waste treatment plant, or actually the waste treatment plant and all of those that came before, the first attempt at doing processing was the first of six which occurred back in 1952 when DOE considered turning the waste in the hamper tanks into granular solid, a process called calcining. After that, they focused on processing primarily the waste that is in the double shell tanks with a facility called the Hanford Waste Vitrification Plant. When it was determined that they needed to process all of the waste from all of the tanks, that plan was abandoned. In the mid-1990s, they again had a, another process in place, including an environmental impact statement that decided to classify all the waste, or which the department decided to do that, 
This was called the tank waste remediation system. That too had problems and faced changes. Later on in the 1990s, the Department of Energy started the waste treatment plant. It was the first try. Before they could begin construction and design, there were revisits to that effort in a process called privatization, where the department decided to, instead of building a single plant themselves, is to bid out the construction and production of a waste treatment plant to two competing contractors, each one of whom was guaranteed some part of the process. When that ultimately failed a couple of years later, due to lack of interest and lack of competition in the bidding, the waste treatment plant was rebid again and brought back to its old state and began construction. There's also now a proposal to look at what to do with the additional waste that cannot be processed through this plant in the next 40 years. And so there's proposed alternate waste forms and the proposal for a second low activity waste facility. And I'll describe what that is again in a moment. A consortium named Bechtel Panford Inc. won the bidding and resumed the design where British Nuclear Fuels Limited had left off at about 30% design completion. <coughs> Seismic concerns, particularly about the uh, Cascadia subduction zone, the big earthquake rift across Oregon and Washington just offshore, led to a two-year stand down and a redesign of parts of the plant. Cost escalated and the schedule slipped, as has happened many times before. Despite serious technical problems, rising costs, and schedule slips, the plant is now being built and is approaching 80% completion. For the waste treatment plant, the project's schedule slips have been significant. The original hot operations were planned to start in 2007. In 2003, due to a variety of issues, that slipped to 2011. In 2005, again due to funding and technical issues, it slipped to 2017. In 2007, again because of the same variety of issues, different specifically, but generally the same, hot operations were pushed off to 2019. Currently, there is another set of problems on technical issues raised by the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board and others that has caused the Department of Energy to revisit parts of the design and now estimate construction of hot operations in 2022. So what is this thing, the waste treatment plant? When you look at it from above, this is late in construction here not that long ago. You can see the, the four big facilities as well as the rest of the facilities. The four big facilities are the high-level waste plant up in the upper left corner, the pretreatment facility where waste comes into the, the whole complex in the upper right, the low-activity waste facility to the lower left where the less radioactive glass will be made, and then the analytical lab which will test all of this as they're running, and the balance of facility with all of the heating and cooling and chemical supplies and all the other necessary things to run from to the side. This is what the plant looked like in July of 2002. And then a bit later, in December of 2003, you can see the giant cranes over the top of the facilities. This is February of 2005 as the walls are going up. And in June of 2006, you can see the pretreatment plant is now well under construction and the low activity waste facilities roof is so the high-level waste facility is just beginning. This is the plant in May 2010. You can see work beginning now actively on the high-level waste plant. And in July of 2011, you can see that the high-level waste facility is now about halfway built. The Hanford Waste Treatment Plant is a very large complex facility. It sits on 65 acres of land. Um, all total, it's expected to consume something around 262,000 cubic yards of concrete, 36,500 tons of steel, and that's the three Eiffel Towers, 2,100 tons of ductwork for ventilation and cooling and all that, and a little over a million feet of piping, about 193 miles worth of the blade end to end, and just shy of 5 million feet, about 900 miles of electrical cabling. 
the cost of the waste treatment plant, originally it was estimated back in 2000-2001 at $4.3 billion to complete. That has escalated through the same time periods I described before through $10.9 billion to the current estimate of $12.2 billion for the entire facility. Hot starts now projected to be actually not in 2019, but full operations in 2022. There are more delays as we speak. Uh, treatment in the plant is scheduled to take 25 years and be complete by 2047, and that too is likely to slip somewhat. In the current year, the Hanford operations are consuming for the Office of River Protection about $1.2 billion. And you can see that that doesn't change much for 2013. Part of the problem at Hanford is that there is a huge cost of just standing in place. As you can see, tank farm activities, most of which is just maintaining the tanks in their current condition, is several hundred million dollars. So what do these plants produce? The high-level waste plant is going to produce extremely radioactive glass that's going to go into the long stainless steel canister, as you see on the left here. These are expected to be two feet in diameter and almost 15 feet high and to contain 6,600 pounds of glass. They expect to produce about 13,500 of these canisters at 600 a year for a total of about 40,500 metric tons of radioactive glass. These will temporarily be stored at Hanford in buildings called canister storage buildings until a national deep geologic repository can be constructed. The other facility, the low activity waste facility, will produce glass as well, also radioactive, though much less so than the high-level waste. These are in somewhat different canisters that are four feet in diameter and seven and a half feet tall. They'll contain about 13,000 pounds of glass each, and the plant is expected to produce about 1,300 containers a year and about 588,000 metric tons of glass. Under the, the decision of an environmental impact statement from 1995, this waste is intended to be disposed of on the Hanford site, but it is subject to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's approval, and they have three criteria in order to determine whether that will be allowed or whether this glass will also have to go into deep, deep geologic repository storage. As we move on to the rest of the waste, the Department of Energy, particularly looking at the cost, has proposed using alternate waste forms. As you can see in this graphic, most of these are some variation on concrete or gravel. So there's a variety of forms of essentially cast stone, ceramicrete, uh, fluidized bed steam reforming product, which is another way to do the same thing, and duralith, which is another kind of, of concrete or stone. They also did, have attempted a couple of times now to press a process called bulk vitrification, where they add glass forming materials essentially sand, and waste into what amounts to a dumpster with ceramic in it, and then heat it with electrodes and run current through it, melt the entire thing, and let it solidify as a monolith. Unfortunately, this process tends to drive technetium-99 and a few other volatile compounds out through the ceramic into the outer lying parts of the, of the uh, container and has not been able to reach acceptable waste conditions. In addition, in the, in the waste treatment plant itself, there have been some very serious problems raised both by internal reviewers as well as by the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. The Safety Board is a, is a group chartered by the U.S. Congress. It's a four-member panel of experts who have a fairly large staff who are on site at all DOE facilities and who monitor DOE projects for nuclear safety. They are not able to direct the Department of Energy what to do, but what they can do is issue what are called recommendations. The recommendations are essentially technical letters suggesting problems and solutions to the Secretary of Energy, who must then respond to the Congress and back to the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board with what they intend to do. The DNFSB issued three major recommendations in 2011 and 2012 related to safety, to technical issues, and to safety culture. The major technical issues included things dealing with the mixing of the tanks and things that are called pulse jet mixers, uh, hydrogen gas creation and piping of vessels with a potential for explosion, 
due to radioactivity tearing the water apart. The possibility of criticalities occurring in tanks because of large particles containing plutonium coming from the tank bottoms, and because of mixing issues, and because and erosion and corrosion of some of the piping because of some of the abrasive materials that are in the tanks. Also, possible safety issues uh, that might involve the public in the event of a large accident, and to some degree, the design of the plant itself, which involves the use of black cells. These are areas within the plant that are intended, once they are completed, to be closed up, to have no lights and no access, and to operate for the next 40 years with no maintenance or changes. And then lastly, they focused a lot on, on a thing called safety culture, which is an easily misunderstood area. The black cells, as I described, are concrete cells buried in the middle of the building to contain tanks and piping and a great deal of complexity, but no actual moving parts. Within the tanks are the pulse jet mixers. And what these are, the, on the left, you can see a cutaway, or actually a see-through kind of diagram of a test assembly for testing pulse jet mixers. The bottom of this mock-up is made out of something like plexiglass. On the right is a diagram showing what these things look like. And essentially what they are is like turkey basters where pull water waste into them using vacuum and then squirt it back out under pressure. In doing that, the hope is that you can stir the waste using this technique and keep it adequately mixed, keep the solids in solution and moving on through the process. The reality, unfortunately, has been different than expected and the wastes have a character that varies anywhere from like ketchup to water and it's become very difficult to ensure that they will mix properly. At the moment, the design of several of these has been stopped as they try to determine whether or not they have an adequate understanding of how they work to actually be able to design them and to develop that understanding so that they can finish the design and finish the facility. One of the things on these is the nozzles on the bottom. This, these nozzles that you see in this picture are from a very small mock-up tank and are not representative of the large ones. But an unexpected thing happened as they were running this test that the abrasive material in the slurry that they used ended up eating holes in the sides of the pipes. This and other issues have caused them to go back and reconsider erosion and corrosion protections within the plant. Next week, Dale Engstrom on our staff is going to come back and talk with you in the third part of our series on the Veda Zone and groundwater protection. And he'll also get into some of the issues related to the movement of the radioactive wastes and chemical waste from the tanks. Uh, this is one example where the uranium plume, the uh, BBXBY tank farm, three tank farms in the 200 East area, one at least of the tanks has suffered a leak which has impacted groundwater and has a plume about a mile long in the groundwater that DOE is now expending a fair amount of effort trying to understand so that they can begin remediation. We did have a video for you with our uh, intern, Becky. Unfortunately, our technical difficulties are not allowing it to play. I, I apologize for last week and the poor audio quality. Uh, we attempted this afternoon to verify that it did work. We thought we had it in hand and in testing it just before this evening's presentation. We turned out we still did not have the difficulties entirely resolved. Um, but in the materials that she sent to you, you'll see a number of different links for places to go for public involvement and to find additional information. And also how you can become, get involved and help resolve these problems. Um, one additional note for myself, in looking around the table at all the people involved in Hanford and here, it's very clear that in about the next five or six years we're going to have to go a sea change where most of those people now involved are going to be leaving and retiring. And we very much need young, younger folks to come into the process and take our place. And so it is very important that people get involved. And with that, I'll turn it over to you folks for your questions. Um, and if you would, please raise your hand if you have questions and type them into the chat and we can go from there.
question. I'm not seeing okay. anything. Ted has a question. Ted has a question. Go, Ted. Well, not working. Well, like last time, we may need you to rely on the chat function. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Let's see. Could you explain why wool was used for the uh, construction of the double shell tank? What the wool was used for was insulation so that they could heat the tank and get it to 1,000 degrees and stay there for four hours without having to use too much fuel. Uh, back in the 1940s and 50s, wool was one of the standard materials used as insulating material. Okay. You guys are being oh. much too easy on me. There we go. How do they plan to clean up the tank leaks to the soil? This is actually a very contentious issue. The, uh, the tanks, as I say, leaked a grand total of about a million gallons of waste containing about a million cubic. And there's a lot of debate and consternation and tooth gnashing about what volume really was there and what the hazard is. The Department of Energy has tried a couple of times now to assess what the, rel the relative risk is of the waste in the tanks, the waste that may remain in the tanks when they're empty and the waste that's already under the tanks. They concluded the amount of waste under the tanks is far worse than the residual that they plan to leave in the tanks, but that in both cases it exceeds acceptable standards. So that gets to then your question, what do you do about that? What the Department of Energy would like to do is put barriers over the top in the hope that by stopping rainwater and other water from infiltrating from above, that they can reduce the rate of transport of this material down through the soil to groundwater to acceptable levels and allow it to decay away in place. We and many others have had some serious questions about whether or not that will ever work, but that's their current plan. Um, yeah. has, has the news? Oh, go ahead. So, <laughs> uh, the question is, I've not seen the news this evening has uh, the news of the leaking double-walled tank hit the media yet? Um, the Department of Energy actually announced it formally the other day, but it did not make a big splash in the news media. And I think the reason is that the leak is from the inside of the inner tank into the annular space and not out into the environment. And also, it's a fairly small leak so far. That doesn't mean that it will continue to be so. So, what future job pathway do you recommend for those interested in working in this field? What are the salaries and what are the risks? Um, there's a lot of different possibilities. There's need particularly for chemical engineers, nuclear engineers, and every other kind. But there's also needs for all kinds of craft skills, um, people who are good welders, electricians, controls people, all kinds of things. Uh, Hanford currently employs something in the neighborhood of 20,000 people and has for the last 20 years and likely will for the next 30 or more. The uh, salaries are generally quite good, particularly in the professional fields. The risks in general are low by industrial standards, but they are unique in some ways from the radiation that, um, that you have to worry about and also from things like heat exposure. One of the problems in operating in, in high radiation environments and other kinds of areas like that is that there's a need for airborne protection as well as skin protection. And so the workers are wearing respirators and inside of contamination clothing, and that gets very hot. And as an example, at the plutonium finishing plant, the local union is now arguing that they should not work on mask for more than two hours under those conditions in a day. Needless to say, that makes it very hard to complete work in some cases. Okay, so the next question. During a tank, tank farm closure, where is the waste pumped to temporarily while a more permanent tank is made for the waste? This is what the double shell tanks have been used for. 
what they do is take a variety of techniques called sluicing, as well as some mining techniques for some of the later tanks. They wash the waste out of the tanks. They run it to the evaporators in some cases where they evaporate away some of the water and put the concentrated waste then into the double shell tanks. The 28 double shell tanks are nearly full. They have about a million and a half or two million gallons of capacity remaining, the rest of it being full. But because of the extreme complexity of the chemical content of the waste of the different tanks, there are some tank waste you cannot mix with others. It would be dangerous. And so as they pump the waste out, they have to be very careful where they pump it to and to make sure it's compatible with the waste it's going to be mixed with. So in the case of the single shell tanks, what they're doing is retrieving the waste, pumping it through secondarily contained piping to the double shell tanks to store it there. Ultimately, in 2022 or later, they will be running that through the waste treatment plant. The, uh, at the moment, they do not have plans to build a new tank or new tank capacity. There is a little bit of tank capacity within the waste treatment plant, about a half a million gallons or so, to allow some blending and mixing. Okay. So, has the Oregon Department of Energy taken a position on whether Bechtel should continue to be the major contractor at the waste treatment plant? No, we haven't. And it's typically not something that we would do. Um, the decisions on contracting and contractors is one that properly is the province of the federal government. We may weigh in on the quality and the needs about what needs to be done or how it needs to be done, but when it actually comes to who the contractor is, we probably will not weigh in. The connection of the single wall tanks with the horizontal pipe seems like a difficult way to fill the three tanks. Why did they not just fill them from the top separately? Was there some benefit to connecting the tanks with the pipes? That actually is a question that I would love to know the answer to and that realistically we would need to talk to some of the folks who were involved in the design of that system. Uh, unfortunately, those designs occurred 60 years ago, and those people are no longer with us. Um, the design actually looks a whole lot like what you might see in a piping design for a sewer, where you have a pipe sliding inside of another pipe, with the idea being that it won't flow backwards, and it'll just continue downward by gravity. What happened to the liquid that was extracted, leaving salts behind it in the single shell tank? The water, or the, the tanks are composed principally of salts and, and a few other materials, but it's water and salts for the most part. Highly radioactive, but salts. In the evaporator, what they do is they heat the waste up until they boil off water. They then condense that water and run it through treatment and dispose of it at facilities on site. The um, contaminants that have been removed from that water then end up being routed either into treatment systems and prepared for disposal on site, or they end up being fed back to the tank farms. Is there an accurate enough survey of the tanks to assess a criticality risk in the tank with water intrusion into the tank? For the actual tank farm tanks, there's been a pretty extensive look at criticality risk. And it's an extremely complex thing to do However, the, there's a number of things in the tank that make it unlikely that a criticality could occur under any condition. The general rule of thumb is that so long as you don't have more than five and a half inches deep of material, that it's not possible to have a criticality. Well, clearly in the tanks, that's far exceeded. So now you have to rely on other things, like having other elements in the tanks which will absorb neutrons and interfere with a chain reaction to prevent it from occurring. And in the case of the tanks, that happens with boron and iron, cadmium, and a lot of other materials, including hafnium and, and gadolinium. There are no more questions. Are there any more questions? Oh, Oop. yep. Okay, let's see. It's at the top. So could you elaborate on why the DNSB is concerned about the black cells and probably elaborate on the DNSB? Okay, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, as I say, is a body chartered by the United States Congress 
And they are technical experts. They are very much modeled after a group that the United States Navy used to oversee their operations. Um, the, the DNFSB's concerns principally started with concerns dealing with the technical issues involving how you mix the waste, about seismic concerns. Where the black cell concern has come from is in part the DNFSB, but even more so the Secretary of Energy himself. What a lot of people have realized in looking at this plant, that when you have facilities that are in rooms that you cannot access, that it becomes extremely difficult to deal with that if something goes wrong. Um, several years ago, there was a sister facility that preceded the waste treatment plant that was built by the British government. And in that facility, they had a similar kind of design. It was also the NFL design. And the piping going into one of the tanks there, also using pulse jet mixers, was vibrated something like two million times, at which point the piping broke. It then lost a couple hundred tons of waste into the cell outside the tank and created a very large problem that took them a fairly long while to detect. Once they did, they now realized they had no way to get into the black cell, and that became even more difficult as they had to find out how they would cut through the five foot thick steel reinforced concrete walls in order to get an access into the area so that they could do the work needed to clean up the mess, repair the piping, and bring the facility back to working status. It wasn't at all easy. All right. I'm waiting to see if we have another one up here. here. We do not at this point. Um, so I'm going to just elaborate on a couple points since we have additional time. The, uh, the Hanford tank wastes are probably one of the most complex things on the Hanford site. As they operated the facilities in the early years, they had five different processing canyons that used different chemical processes in order to separate plutonium and uranium from the nuclear fuel. Because of the way they operated these, the chemistry coming out of them was different, and they routed different parts of it to different tanks. At one point, they realized that they were looking for more uranium, and the largest single uranium mine in the world was the uranium in the Hanford tanks. And so at that point, they began to chemically process tank waste to separate out uranium and then put the tank waste back in the tanks. That chemically changed it and made it more complex. Later still, they had tanks that were called self-boiling tanks. Um, one of these in particular, the A105 tank, in 1965 actually exploded. What had happened is that they put the radioactive waste in the tank containing large amounts of radioactive cesium and strontium that generate a lot of heat. And the temperature in the tank bottom and the concentrated waste became so great that it overheated the concrete in the bottom of the tank to the point that the water in the concrete expanded to form steam and blew up the concrete. At that point, the bottom of the tank was lifted something in the neighborhood of 8 to 15 feet, and a large gash was opened in the tank. Um, when they did that, they also ended up with a steam venting occurring where they had live steam coming out of an adjacent tank because the ventilation systems were interconnected. And the tank farm operator entered the farm with a radiation measuring instrument and measured airborne radiation levels at 500 millirem per hour, which is a very high level. Ooh, we have another question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the first is, we're wondering what the picture is of. <laughs> ah, sorry. Um, as you noticed last week, Cam had a picture of a pizza box as a radiation symbol. This particular one looks like a question mark. And actually, it's a question of my own as to what on earth it is. If you use Google Earth and you go look at the Hanford site and you go find the commercial nuclear power plant on the site, the Columbia Generating Station, over in one corner on the site, for no apparent reason, is this green area of trees surrounded by a fence. I have no idea why it's there. The other question. Um, what magnitude of a Cascadia earthquake are the tanks designed to withstand? The tank farms, single shell and double tank, were never designed to withstand a Cascadia scale earthquake. 
These were designed to earthquake standards of the day, which are considerably less than what is required for construction today or for withstanding something like a Cascadia event. And so earthquakes like that, as well as other issues that we know about now that we didn't know then, are part of the reason why it is so essential that we have to get these facilities built and get the waste out of these tanks. Next one. Well, if we don't have any further questions, I want to thank you all very much. And I encourage you to come back next week on Tuesday, as Dale Engstrom will be presenting on the Groundwater and Veda Zone. And the following week, when Paul Schaefer of our staff will be talking about natural resource and environmental issues, which have a great deal more complexity than you might imagine. And then finally, the week after that, we will return again, and Ken Miles will close us out with a talk about transportation issues and all of the things that are going on there. So again, thank you very much for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful evening.